Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshore, host, and our guest is John McKay, professor of Slavic languages and literatures and film and media studies. His research interests include 19th and 20th century Russian literature, Russian and Soviet culture, comparative literature, literary and cultural theory, and film studies, especially film theory and documentary cinema. Professor McKay's recent publications include True Songs of Freedom, Uncle Tom's Cabin in Russian Culture and Society, Four Russian Surf Narratives, and Inscription and Modernity, From Wordsworth to Mandelstam. Today we talk with Professor McKay about his forthcoming book, Ziga Vertov, Life and Work. Welcome, Professor McKay. Thanks for having me, Marilyn. Let's get right to the book. Tell us about it. Well, this is a book uh, that's a critical biography of the filmmaker Ziga Vyartov, who lived between 1896 and 1954. Mm -hmm. uh, he was born in what is now Poland, the eastern part of Poland, and then worked his entire career after the Russian Revolution in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So he's one of the most important figures in the history of Soviet film. And th what the study does is look at both his, his upbringing, actually, mm -hmm. his, uh, his life during the war years, and then his entire filmmaking career up until the late 1930s, uh, at which point the book changes a bit and it becomes about um, his last 20 years, which were essentially a, p a period of dormancy. He wasn't allowed to work effectively, oh, okay. right? So it's a long period of decline, actually, mm -hmm. in the last section of the book. But uh, prior to that, there was this very fertile moment of filmmaking. Okay. Yeah. And we'll get back to all that in a minute, but I am very curious to know what led you to write this book? Well, I was introduced, actually, to Ziga Vyartov um, by Charlie Musser, who mm -hmm. teaches here in Film and Media Studies when I was a TA for his intro to film class, which I actually teach now. I, uh -huh. I teach that class. And um, that was the first time that I saw Ziga Vyartov's most famous film, Man with a Movie Camera, which is shown in a lot of introductory mm -hmm. film classes. And um, that film interested me a lot because it brought together several different interests I have. It's a documentary film, mm -hmm. a self-proclaimed nonfiction film. It's an experimental or avant-garde film. And it's also a Soviet film. Uh, a, a film that was made at a very important point in Soviet history. So it brought together a lot of interest. And then when I started to teach, when I got hired here, I found that there was almost nothing written on him that was really grounded in archival research. Okay. And so I went over to Russia and found that there was in fact a gigantic archive mm -hmm. and started to build up some work. So really it was teaching that was my initial prompts to work on, on Vyartov. Okay, and in terms of your methodology, you mentioned that a lot of the work was archival work um, in Russia. Mm -hmm. So did you do anything else outside of that? Well, yeah, I mean, there's um, uh, there I worked in both paper and film archives. Uh, film archives in Sweden, uh, in the United States. Uh, I went to various film festivals where certain films were shown. Um, but then there's an awful lot of extra research about the time, about the history. Um, as you may know, since about 1991 or so, after the end of the Soviet Union, there's been a real revolution in the, hist in the historical writing about the Soviet Union because okay. the archives opened up. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our, our I mean, our, a many of our conceptions, especially about sort of detailed things, have changed over the course of that time. In so I wanted way? to integrate. Well, we simply know more about how people lived on the ground. Okay, okay there's a, there are a lot of questions we, that has still have not been answered, that's for sure. But we do know more about um, the way that certain kinds of institutions worked. Um, we certainly also know more about um, some of the more catastrophic aspects, of mm -hmm. course, of Soviet history, particularly those that happened in the 1930s. Um, and the war period as well, which all of which he lived through mm -hmm. and even to some extent documented. So those are, I mean, those are just some of the mm -hmm. big innovations that have right, happened. Right. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about his life. Tell us sure. about um, who he was. Well, Ziga Vyartov is a pseudonym, actually. Nobody is called Ziga Vyartov in Russia. It's okay. just, it's a, a Ziga is a, 
is a nickname that he got. It's hard to say where it came from. Ziga is the word in Ukrainian for a top, a spinning, a spinning. like a toy top, mm -hmm. right? And Vyertov is actually a pseudonym that he came up with. It comes from the word to spin, the Russian word to spin, and it relates to our words like invert or revert and mm -hmm. so on. It's got the same kind of root. And um, uh, his real name was David Kaufman, okay? And he was, uh, he was from a Jewish family in Bialystok. Bialystok was, at that point, in the Russian Empire, probably the most Jewish city in terms of just population mm -hmm. in the Russian Empire. Um, his dad was a bookseller who had a great big bookstore that also had a reading room that was quite important in the city. And he had two brothers, both of whom, in crazily enough, became filmmakers as wow. well. Um, one of them, uh, Mikhail Kaufman, his, this, the next oldest brother, uh, worked with Vyartov in the 1920s and had a distinguished career in, in the Soviet Union. His youngest brother, uh, Boris Kaufman, whose archive we have here at the, at the Beinecke Library, went to France and he shot all the films of Jean Vigo, one of the most famous of all French filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Uh, you perhaps have heard of On the Waterfront. Of course. He shot and won the Academy Award for wow. cinematography for that film. He shot the only film that Samuel Beckett was involved with, uh -huh. actually, a film simply called Film with uh, Buster Keaton. Uh -huh. um, he, shot, um, a film, he shot films for uh, Sidney Lumet, like um, The Pawn Broker, for instance. So he had a very, very distinguished career both in France and in the United mm -hmm. States. So it's a very intriguing cinematic family right, as well, right. right? That they seem to have uh, developed, well, the two oldest developed together, mm -hmm. but the youngest, Boris, he really just seemed to, in a sense, he knew that his brothers were working, but mm -hmm. he developed really quite independently. Now, how did they how did they get involved in filmmaking? Well, that's an interesting story because actually, um, Vyertov's, when they, when growing up in Bialystok, um, there was, uh, Vyartov had a good friend, a guy whose name was Friedland, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Friedland, who later became, he changed his name too, and he became Mikhail Kaltsov, who was the most famous of all early Soviet journalists. He's like the Edward R. Murrow wow. of the early Soviet Union. Uh -huh. This is also from this place, okay? Uh -huh. He got Vyartov a job in the fledgling Soviet film industry in the nonfiction part of it. They were making newsreels and other kinds of nonfiction films in 1918. Okay, mm -hmm. so he needed a job. Um, he hadn't had any prior professional filmmaking experience. He might have been involved with making scientific films at the institute he studied in in Petrograd during the First World War, mm -hmm. which was called the Psychoneurological Institute. And so he, it seems as though that's quite likely that he did. And so he had, there was a kind of interest in film. Certainly there was a deep, deep interest in art, and especially mm -hmm. in poetry and music, okay? But in a way, he just got thrown into this by chance, actually. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's talk about his filmmaking. Right. Um, you mentioned um, one of the movies that actually you're going to be showing here at Yale, The Man Behind the Camera? Man with a Movie the Camera. The Man with a Movie Camera. Yeah. Um, Let's talk a little bit about that, and would you call it his um, most, his masterpiece, for lack of a, a more yeah. apt word? Well, most people would say that, actually. Really? Okay. I mean, that it is, uh, certainly it's the best known of his films. Okay. Um, although, uh, it's actually only now been restored in, t in its more or less original form. For many, many years, the film was only available in what was in a basically a, a, a sound film aperture, that is to say a slight amount of the image was taken off one side in order to leave room for a soundtrack, which mangled the image, actually. Uh -huh. So there was one print of the film that was left by Vyartov in the Netherlands that was, that was what we call oh. silent film aperture. Okay. And, so, and that makes a difference when you're talking about photography that's that carefully mm -hmm. composed, okay? So yeah, his films, the basic, thing that uh, w people sort of know about Vyartov is that he was militantly in favor of nonfiction film and militantly against fiction film. And why is that? And the reason was, I mean, there's a number of reasons why that is the case, but certainly from the point of view of, let's say, politics, he believed that to Fiction film, essentially, if it were to be sort of restored within the Soviet context, and again, they wanted to create a new society in the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. right? 
this would amount to simply dragging in all these old stereotypes about people, men, women, specific characters, peasants, workers, like different character types, mm -hmm. plot cr uh, cliches and so forth. And this was just unnecessary okay. because the camera doesn't need any of that. The ca with, and cinematography and cinema in general doesn't need any of that. You can use the camera to explore the world and create different kinds of arrangements of image and sound that don't depend in any way on all those old pre-revolutionary narrative mm -hmm. character stereotypes. Okay. So what would he be filming? What is the movie like? Well, in the case of Man with the Movie Camera, um, what he films is, it's actually difficult to limit what he says. Well, the main thing that he films is he films the cameraman filming. Okay. And is it autobiography, so, uh, more or less an autobiography of him? or? Well, um, it's interesting. I mean, there is a way in which it does have a certain, it's certainly a reflection on the kind of work that he did. He does appear in the film at one point in the mm -hmm. film. Um, but what it, um, what it is, is a film that is, it's, it's, first of all, the film is extremely complexly edited. And one of the things that he seemed to want to do was to show that, uh, Nonfiction film, contrary to what might be thought, can be infinitely more creative, more dynamic, more interesting, mm -hmm. more loaded than fiction film. And that's the opposite of even what today people think. They think, oh, I'm going to watch a documentary film, right? I mean, it's going to be more boring and this and that, right? It's just a cliche, right? Mm -hmm. And that was the cliche even back then. Or it's just going to give one information or whatever, right? Vyertsev said, no, no, no. There's absolutely no reason for this. And that's one of the film, things that the film tries to demonstrate. So when you see it, uh, you, a anyone who encounters it the first time senses it as something just overwhelmingly sort of overstuffed in a certain sense, right? Mm -hmm. It really hits you hard, okay? Um, that's one thing that he was trying to do. Um, the other thing is that he, in this film, is that he was, uh, there's a kind of anti-illusionism in Vyartov. So one of the, he, he was someone who, rightly or wrongly, um, felt that the traditional vocation of art to create beautiful or pleasing illusions was questionable. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that he continually does in the film is to break the illusion. Now, of course, you, you can't get rid of illusion in film. It's impossible. Film mm -hmm. is just images. Right. It is just, you know, it's, you know, images projected on the screen. So what he does continually is he shows, he'll show an image, he'll show the ca what the cameraman did to get the image, then he'll show what the editor did or is doing in mm -hmm. order to put the images together. So at a certain point in the film, it's like you're watching at least three films at once. The film as it's sort of happening in front right. of you, the film as it's shot, and the film as it's being put together, uh -huh. which makes it an unusually complex experience. But at the same time, I, I guess what's what's really kind of miraculous about it is that he does this with just extraordinary grace and deftness, mm -hmm. right? It is, again, from a sensory point of view, it happens very fast and quick and so on, but there's a kind of, at the same time, he manages a kind of clarity that you wouldn't think would be possible, mm -hmm. actually. And that's, I think, that's one of the reasons why people admire the film so much. Okay. And what about some of his other films? Well, um, his other film, he was a... Uh, uh, actually involved, I mean, most of, most of his films were, uh, let's call them agitational or propaganda films that were done on order, okay? Mm -hmm. And he took those orders, okay? From, from for instance, he wrote, he, he uh, put together a film for the Moscow City Council when they were getting, when they were having elections called Stride Soviet that was actually a kind of propaganda film mm -hmm. about the, the achievements of the City Council. Um, but he used these f a film like that to conduct all kinds of experiments. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in that film, you never see any of the members of the city council. Instead of uh, a meeting of the council or a meeting of people before the council and so on, he has a meeting of cars and, like, cars and machines talking to each other. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely eccentric kind of a decision, right? He has, uh, he inserts uh, experiments in editing into films like this, mm -hmm. right? Needless to say, the Moscow City Council was not totally happy was... with this type <laughs> of thing, right? So that was, that was one of the things that he did. So uh -huh. 
And yet at the same time, he did take them seriously as in terms of the assignment that he was given, mm -hmm. right? Um, he was very, very interested in sound. Before he was interested in filmmaking, he was interested in sound. He was an, a, a very skilled and tutored musician. He studied at the Bialystok Conservatory. Mm -hmm. he, he studied at a military musical institute during the First World War. And he was very interested, apparently, even before the revolution, in m using non-musical sound in an artistic way. Okay, mm -hmm. So organizing, so he was interested in, the, for instance, the sound of sawmills. Okay. okay. So in a film, when of course, sound starts to come in 1927, 28, in, in the world of cinema, it doesn't come in until about 29, 30 in the Soviet Union. He makes the first sound film mm -hmm. in Ukraine, actually. He made three of his, probably his three greatest films in Ukraine. And so he made a film called Enthusiasm in 1930 that actually integrates industrial noise in a musical way. So he would record it and then organize it in such a way that he, that it created these musical patterns. Mm -hmm. This film also created a scandal for this reason, but it's now seen as the predecessor of all kinds of later noise experiments in mm -hmm. music. Why was it a scandal? Well, because it was thought to be unbelievably noisy and cacophonous uh -huh. and so forth, right? And uh, that nobody would like it and workers wouldn't like mm -hmm. it and so forth. Um, it's difficult. Uh, part of the reason for uh, the scandal might also have been sound reproduction capacity there. So we don't quite, mm -hmm. I mean, he was really, I mean, way ahead of his time in terms of what he was trying to do with the film. And it's not clear that the, uh, that the you know, sound capacity of the theaters that he, was, uh, that he was dealing with, like mm -hmm. the amplifiers and so on, could really handle it, right? right, right so right. that's another question. It's a little bit, it's uh -huh. a little bit un uncertain, okay. right? Yeah, it met with a better response in the West, actually. So, you know, as I'm sitting here listening to you, you had mentioned that he was very much into poetry at one point. Mm -hmm. And then you state how he was almost militantly against any kind of um, fiction or illusion in his movies. Mm -hmm. And to me, that kind of contradicts him being a poet. Mm -hmm. D did he grapple with that at all? Well, you've identified uh, one of the many contradictions <laughs> that uh, he sort of characterize his work. Okay. Uh, this is very good. Uh -huh. uh, he, he, the kind of poetry that he was particularly interested in is, this is rather difficult to convey the sense of it in English. Um, he was very interested in some of the poetry of the Russian futurists. And the poetry in particular that he seemed to really like was a kind of poetry that, even though it had a kind of sense, there was a kind of meaning, you when you read it, it was almost as like, as though the meaning was sort of emerging out of the sounds of the, of the, of the letters themselves. Mm -hmm. Rather than using sound in order to convey some sort of meaning, the letters, the material of the letters came first. Interesting. Okay. And, uh, and certainly in such a way that it didn't, it felt almost more like the sounds were expressing themselves rather than a poet, for instance, mm -hmm. okay? And that, this, this is at least his way of thinking about this particular kind of poetry. In other words, it's a kind, it was a kind of poetry that also got rid of a lot of the standard tropes, cliches, conventions of poetry, mm -hmm. of, of, of lyric poetry, right? Okay. That really treated language as a kind of raw material, mm -hmm. independently of pre-existing literary convention. It's really that, uh, sort of uh, extraction of convention or ejection of mm -hmm. convention okay. from art that was was really central to his work. Yeah. Let's jump to the last 20 years of his life. You mentioned yeah. that he virtually did right. not produce anything. Right. What was going on? Well, it's a complicated story. I mean, he um, there were a number of things. Um, after he made his last major film, Three Songs of Lenin, in 1934, which was a major success. During the course of that film, he got ill. And uh, it's not quite clear what the illness was, but his health started to fail him, mm -hmm. clearly at this point. And that seems to have been one of the factors. Another thing is that um, in the Soviet Union, I mean, it, like in other places too, uh, 
it was important to have patrons, okay? Now, patronage relationships are important in any society, in my view. I've mm -hmm. noticed them even here, right? But in the Soviet Union, it was crucial. And Vyertov limited the number of patrons he could get, in part by alienating a lot of people in the 1920s with his militant attacks on fiction film. Mm -hmm. That clearly, even though, I mean, you know, one could question how serious they were. They, they were taken seriously by a lot of people in the film industry. Mm -hmm. And he did, you know, uh, upset a lot of people. So that was one thing. And he was never a part of the film education institutions that started to exist already in the 1920s, which were huge, okay? Uh, if, you, if one taught within the film school, the main film schools, that was a sort of instant way that you could create a kind of a body of people around yourself, sure. right? Um, then, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the 1930s, the end of the 1930s, of course, there was the Great Terror. And a number of people who had, in fact, helped him along the way, including the aforementioned Mikhail Kaltsov, this famous journalist, were killed in the Terror. Uh. Yeah. At the, in, in his case, right at the end of it, actually, very late in 1939. Okay. So that, again, sort of wipes out a a possible source of support, right, of push mm -hmm. within the industry, because you really needed that, okay? Um, so those are a couple of the factors. And then bad luck, too. There was a major project that was about to get off the ground right at the beginning of 1941. Mm -hmm. But you know what happened in June 1941. And so that was, uh, that uh, ended. And then, um, in, during the war, he was, they were evacuated to Kazakhstan, where much of the film industry was. He did make uh, a, 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 few, a couple films there, actually, quite interesting in their own way. Um, but he wasn't able to work as freely as he wanted to. And then over the, during the war, he found out at the end of the war that um, his entire family, the ones who'd stayed in Bialystok, had all been killed by the Nazis. Oh, wow. okay, so the whole place, all of them. And this seemed to have a major effect on his work. I should mention um, somebody I have not mentioned yet, which is his wife, Yel Elizaveta Svilova, who he got together with at the beginning of the 1920s. Um, her career, uh, they basically worked on all their films together. Mm -hmm. They're like a, like a dyad, effectively. And um, it's interesting, in light of what I just said about Vyartov's family, that she's the one who edited the very first film about Auschwitz the very first film about Auschwitz, and was also the uh, co-director of the first major film, a giant film, uh, about the Nuremberg trials. Okay. Okay. So um, these were, we know also from correspondence that Vyartov took an interest in the fate of his family, of course, mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. And it does seem as though this kind of cast a shadow over him. And then the final blow was really delivered in 1949 when after the establishment of the State of Israel, initially you know that the Soviet Union was on the side of it, was with Israel, and then there was of course this major split that occurred. And this was accompanied in, by, in, within the Soviet Union on a kind of campaign against Jewish intellectuals. Okay. Okay. He got caught up in the middle of this and was publicly attacked by the Deputy Minister of Cinematography. And he went on stage uh, and was going to himself denounce his formalist experiment man with the movie camera, mm -hmm. but he had a breakdown and he couldn't deliver the speech and he was carried off and uh, essentially he fell into silence after that. Mm -hmm. He worked occasionally on newsreels and so forth, right, but basically that was it. Until oh, he, that's he, a sad ending. And he died of stomach cancer uh, um, in uh, 1954. Mm -hmm. so. Well, after all of that, do you think um, his work had an influence on other filmmakers? It did. I mean, we know that it had an influence within the Soviet Union um, the, uh, in various ways, uh, sometimes an influence that was even denied. Uh, certainly in the 1920s, one can see there were certain people that he worked with who continued to make films, documentary films. Whether they're really in the, f in the spirit of Ziga Vyartov is another question. Mm -hmm. Um, there were a few people who got to know about his work uh, during his trips abroad. He made two trips abroad to Europe, and they also kind of kept the flame alive. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that his films were essentially unknown or, and unwatched mm 
between about 1935 and about 1955, with a couple very rare exceptions, okay? Uh, so 20 years, which, is, which are 20 of the most important years in mm -hmm. film history, really he's unknown. You start to get a, a, a revival, a small revival, at the end of the 1950s, beginning of the 60s, starting in the Soviet Union. But then, um, as prints start to become available, uh, he becomes a very, very important figure, starting at the end of the 1960s and the beginning of the 1970s, when various kinds of radical filmmakers uh, in the United States, in Europe, and so forth, interested in either politically or formally radical filmmaking, look to his work as a kind of model. Mm -hmm. okay. So, for instance, the famous Jean-Luc Godard, one of the most famous mm -hmm. French filmmakers, in his, in his most politically radical phase, he, he set up a group, actually just him and another guy, called the Ziga Vyartov Group, yeah. okay, named after him. Right? Whether or not they made films in Vyartov's spirit is another question, right? Mm -hmm. but his yeah. radical stance vis-a-vis -vis the existing cinema was something that they took as inspirational. Mm -hmm. um, and then later, starting again in the early 1970s, with the emergence of academic film studies in, in university curricula, you start to get essays being written, um, mostly about man with a movie camera, some, sometimes about his life as well. Mm -hmm. And those, and VHS tapes started to appear and all the rest of it. And gradually, gradually, he starts to become canonized as part of the film studies curriculum. Mm -hmm. In around 1983, a major uh, edition of his writings appears in English. It had appeared in 1966 in, in, in Russian. And um, so by now, by this time, effectively, at least within film studies, again, I'd say Man with a Movie Camera is probably the most studied of all Soviet films, mm -hmm. in just generally, even more than Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin or anything like that. And many, many filmmakers now speak of him as an influence. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, so it's interesting. So it's a, he's a pioneer of film in some ways, but his real effect is belated. Right. You know. Right. Well, this is, has been fascinating. Great. Thanks for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Oh, you're very welcome, Marilyn. Thanks. For more information about Professor McKay and his research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Mm -hmm.